go ahead and get this rolling. So welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. So I have good news. This is the last anatomy course you're going to take in PT school. All right. Now, what I will say is that we're going to start this course a little differently. All right. So what I'd like everyone to do is go ahead and stand up here for me. Okay, very good. Now, everyone, go ahead and lift your left leg. Good. I want to make sure everyone started the course on the right foot. There's your dad joke. <laughs> Kay Kaylee, I told you it was going to be appropriate. That's not a bad one. Not a bad one, right? Solid five out of ten. Solid five out of ten. So we got a couple things that are going to change for this course. Okay, so number one is for the first half of this course, the good news, there are very little muscle attachments to memorize. Hooray, right? That's yay, we like that. We will be covering the thorax, the heart, the lungs, the viscera, the gut and all the organs, things of that nature, which is gonna have its own challenges. Don't get me wrong, because there's gonna be some terminology that are gonna be kind of new. At the same time, like I said, we're not really going to cover a lot of muscle attachments really until the month of March when we actually get back into the pelvis and the hip and the lower extremity. The other thing, and, and this is more a change, I did kind of some reflecting over how last semester went. And not that I thought anything went like terribly wrong or anything, but I want to make this course as good as possible. Because COVID is a real thing, right? We got some folks online right now. We got some folks, I mean, it's just things are kind of going crazy. I have made the decision that I'm going to record all the lectures. OK, so what you're going to see is I'm going to be up here for most of the time wearing my $30 headset from Walmart. And it, hey, man, this thing's going on six years, right? So I think it's money well spent. Yeah, exactly. Got my money's worth. Yeah, Walmart. Um, but I'm going to record the lectures. And I'm going to post them to a YouTube channel. OK, so that way you guys will have access. So if you guys miss something in class, don't worry about it, right? And go back. You can watch the lectures. This is something that we did last year because we were totally hybrid. And because we switched to Microsoft Teams this year as an institution, you guys might be aware of that and might not be aware of that. And because we were back live, I decided not to do it for a semester. Like I said, kind of reflected and said, you know what? Eh, I'm going to go ahead and record the lectures and try to make this course as accessible as possible. OK, so hopefully that helps out. OK, are we in favor of that? Is anyone not in favor of that? If you're not in favor of it, just don't watch the recordings. OK. All right, so let's get down into it. So when it comes to heart and mediastinum, the first thing we're really going to cover is going to be just kind of this thoracic wall. And we talked about this thoracic wall a little bit when we talked about the thorax and the thoracic spine at the very end of last semester. And I know that seems like it was like last year because it kind of was. But really what I want you to start looking at is not necessarily the posterior aspect of the thorax, which we will cover, but it's going to be more the inside of the thorax. OK, so inside the thorax, we're going to have obviously heart, pericardium. We will spend not a significant amount of time on the pericardium, but I want to make sure, especially as physical therapists, you understand the differences between the heart and the pericardium because it is very important. Also, we're going to cover a little bit of the lungs and then we'll start working our way, like I said, into the diaphragm and into the viscera. Now, in the context of this course, I'm going to cover the anatomy. OK, you guys have had some physiology already. You guys will also have another course called cardiopulmonary rehabilitation. I'm going to let them dig into a lot of the inner workings of the heart. OK, we're going to cover the anatomy so you guys can do things like identify the structures in lab. You guys kind of know how things work and kind of talk about how the valves work and things like that. But in terms of in-depth cardiopulm, that's all going to be next year. OK, so we're not going to cover it too, too much. Same thing with the viscera. We're going to cover kind of how everything's put together. But you guys have already had some physiology. You guys will continue to have physiology. Dr. Justice does a phenomenal job explaining that stuff. And I'm not going to step on his toes. OK, any questions on that? OK, fantastic. So when it comes to thoracic wall, what we really kind of have to think about is the fact that 
we're just still going to have a manubrium. We're still going to have a sternum. OK, we have to remember those things. And we have to remember that. We're going to have some ribs, right? We remember our ribs. So what we're going to do is just draw out a little bit. Don't worry, my drawings have not gotten any better. OK, no, I didn't take any art classes over the break. I know I'm not going to. OK, so this is going to be our manubrium. And then remember, we're going to have kind of solid piece coming down. And that's going to be our sternum. And then we're going to have this tiny little thing down here at the bottom, which if you ever got hit in this piece, it really hurts and you can fracture it. And this is going to be my xiphoid process. Now, in terms of how the ribs attach into the sternum, remember that the actual rib in terms of attachment into the sternum is not going to have a bone to bone attachment. What we're going to have is we're actually going to have a rib. And I'm just going to draw one of these not to make the picture too confusing. So here's our rib, OK? And remember that my ribs in terms of anatomy. Are going to be my costals. OK, that's going to become very important because as we start getting into the myology, as we start getting into some of the structures in this section, we're going to have all sorts of intercostals. OK, so kind of taking a little bit step back. Don't forget your terms. Don't forget the previous prefixes and the suffixes and a lot of things we cover, right? So we all remember what inter means. Inter is going to mean between. Costal is going to mean rib. So in terms of my intercostal space, that's just going to be the space between my ribs. OK, and also you may have a patient. My dad actually had this way, way back when he had costochondritis. So costal meaning rib, cond meaning cartilage or joint, and itis meaning inflammation. So he had inflammation of the cartilage of his joints or his ribs, I should say. So think about terms like that, like these medical terms are very scary if you let them be scary. So remember that. Like I said, we don't have a bone to bone attachment here. We're going to have a little section. Of what we're going to call. Costal cartilage. And that's important to remember because not only in terms of pliability of tissue, right? Because what would you guys think if I had a bone and I had cartilage, which one, which one's going to have a little more give? Which one's going to have a little more bounce to it? Probably prima cartilage, exactly. And that becomes very important because when I inspire, when I take an air, and when I expire, I need those ribs to move up and down, right? So when I inspire, those ribs are going to flare out, move upward. When I expire, those ribs are going to move back down. So I need a nice pliable surface for them to act on, right? Think about the amount of friction and rubbing that would happen every time I breathe in and breathe out if I had a bone to bone attachment there between my costals and my sternum. Sorry, stuff's on fire. <clears throat> it's been a very busy break, so I'm going to say. Um, so that cartilage is very important for a lot of that pliability. Now, here's the problem. Cartilage. Can get ripped. Cartilage can get torn. And let's think about this, and this happens quite often. Let's say I have a patient was involved in a front end motor vehicle accident. Older car, no airbag. There's a good possibility that they went forward and the steering will hit them in the chest, right? That's a reasonable scenario. One thing that oftentimes gets missed because everyone looks at a rib fracture, right? Oh, they got fractured ribs or a fractured sternum. A lot of times you're going to have patients that are going to have ongoing chest pain because they have a torn piece of cartilage. Okay, and actually there's not a ton they can do for it, but 
guess who they're going to see and who the, what provider they're going to access 10, 14, 21 days after the accident. It's going to be you. So they're going to come up to you and say, hey, why do I still have this chest pain? Well, you have this chest pain potentially because you have a little bit of torn cartilage on top of this. OK, so you need to be able to explain that mechanism as well. So in terms of the thoracic wall, really start thinking about and Graze does a very nice job at explaining how the ribs are moving up and down with inspiration and expiration. Also understand the difference between, and you guys probably remember this. Do you guys remember the difference between true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs? Mm -hmm. It's okay if you don't. It's okay. It's, it's been a long break, right? Okay, so we have true ribs, false ribs, floating ribs. I'll put those in a little box. Okay, so what do you guys think? What would a true rib be? Connects directly to the sternum. So a bunch of ribs connecting directly to the sternum or one rib? One rib, okay? So I got one rib that connects into the sternum, one rib to sternum. No, I can't spell either. Now, false ribs, okay, what do we think false ribs are? I got a whole bunch of ribs or a group of ribs that all have one common connection. Now, taking a look at the picture up here, and this one's out of netters, because I just think it has a better picture than Gray's. If we think about it, these false ribs have a lot more cartilage than my true rib, right? Now, why do you think that is? Closer to the diaphragm, what advantage or disadvantage would that prove? Okay, so closer to the diaphragm, it needs a little more movement back and forth for inspiration and expiration. The other thing, is just flat out distance, right? If we think about it, where does my sternum stop? It stops eh, about here, right? So let's call that T5, T6, right in that area. Well, I have ribs. For me, my last false rib stops down here, almost at my iliac crest. I need something that's gonna cover that gap. And to be quite honest with you, cartilage, is not only easier to maintain, right? Because bone takes a lot of energy to resorb and build and everything. But cartilage is also, to your point, much more flexible. It gives me some more motion and more movement. So with these false ribs, what we see is we're going to have a lot more costal cartilage. Because we're going to say more costal cartilage. Now that's important to remember because like I said, we could have a condition like a costochondritis. And if we're dealing with potentially a false rib, all those false ribs come together and they form one common attachment, right? So rib eight, nine, 10, 11, they're all going to form this very, very common attachment. Now, my last rib is going to be my floating rib. Now, my floating rib, the reason it's called a floating rib, is that we're not going to have any sternal attachment here. And that becomes its own separate issue simply because let's think about this. OK, so. And, and the reason I bring up combat sports so much is because it is becoming quite popular in this country, not only at the adult level, we can warrior level, but there are several high schools nationwide that have started their own MMA programs. So get prepared, it's coming. And I've already seen some 15, 16 year old MMA fighters. If I get hit around T11, T12, there's a possibility that I may fracture that floating rib. What direction is that floating rib gonna go when I take an external force? from the side. It's going to go inward, 
right? Exactly. It's going to poke inward. Well, do we see any problems with the rib poking inward? Other than it hurting really bad, what problems do we have with ribs poking inward? We've got some organs there too, don't we? So where do your kidneys lie? About L1, L2, right? Right on either side of the spine. Where's your spleen? Right? Spleen's left hand quadrant, somewhere right around like T8, T9. So there's a lot of implications that can happen if that individual takes an external force. And it doesn't have to be combat sports. It could be football, soccer. It could be a lot of different things, right? It could be a, a fall on another player or just a fall and they try to brace themselves, right? I mean, think about that. If I brace myself and put my forearm at about T11 or T12, there's a possibility I could have a fractured rib from that impact. Makes sense. Now, this is the reason we're going to learn a lot of the viscera is because as we're going to see, not only in this course, but also when you take medical screening and imaging with me next year, we're going to have a lot of organs right there. Every organ does something different, right? Liver does something different than my spleen. Spleen does something different than my pancreas. Pancreas does something different than my gallbladder. We know that, right? That's basic stuff. Why is that important though? Why do you guys think that's important to know? Clinical presentation, signs and symptoms, right? So if my patient's having trouble digesting and processing fatty foods, what organ helps with processing fatty foods? Gallbladder, right? So if all of a sudden it's like, you know, I went to Taco Bell and I'm not doing so hot. Now, don't get me wrong. No one does real hot after Taco Bell, okay? <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, bad, bad example, bad example. <laughs> all right, let's, let's go with Chick-fil-A, okay? Let's go with Chick-fil-A, yeah. But, you know, if, if someone can't process those certain types of food, then we may have to start looking at having some enzyme testing done, okay? I Believe it or not, guys, as weird as it's going to sound, I've called up several physicians and said, hey, I think they need to have some blood work done because they're displaying these signs and symptoms. Why? Because they were in that high-end car accident last Sunday, went through the ED, ED released them, went and accessed their primary care, primary care said, go see PT. Nobody looked at this stuff. And then they come in and see me and it's like, you know, I'm still having this really bad pain on my side. And you need to investigate that. Okay, so that's kind of how all this starts to fit together. So believe it or not, it's not just, you know, kind of the nice to know stuff. Any questions on that? Other than just providing a little bit of, so I'm going to repeat the question since I'm doing this hybrid. Um, so the question was, do the floating ribs serve any purpose? They do. They provide a little bit of extra protection to the bottom of the rib cage. They actually provide a little bit of extra protection to the subcostal nerve. So that we're going to find out the subcostal nerve is actually very, very important in terms of organ function and pelvis function. And then the floating ribs also just provide another little attachment for like my subcostal muscles. OK, so that's kind of what they do. Um, other than that, other than bugging anatomy students, it really doesn't do much. Keeping you guys up at night, right? Which I will say, that's another benefit of me recording this. If I put anybody to sleep, like if you have insomnia, just turn me off for a half hour, and you guys will go right to sleep. <clears throat> I'm honest like that one. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the pericardium here. Okay, so when we talk about the pericardium, what we're going to do is we're going to separate out that word. Okay, so what we have here is we have the word peri. Okay, so what's peri mean? What's that? Around, next to. Beside, you know, those are all kind of the common. Definitions and then what's cardium mean? Heart, right? So my pericardium is around my heart or next to my heart, beside my heart. Now, the reason that I put in. Phrenic nerves for the pericardium. 
We talked about the phrenic nerve very, very briefly last semester. OK, we talked about it in terms of that cervical plexus. I know I brought up cervical plexus. But the phrenic nerve is actually very important because as we probably remember from last semester a little bit and a little bit even in undergrad, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive or keeps the guy or the girl alive. Most commonly we associate the phrenic nerve with the diaphragm, right? That's just where it goes. Well, the phrenic nerve also shoots off a lot of branches that innervate the pericardium. Now, why is that important? As a physical therapist, OK, I'm going to walk out. I'm going to get my patient from the waiting room, right? Ms. McGillicuddy, how are you doing today? Is Ms. McGillicuddy saying they're going to say to you, I think my pericardium is off today. Now, what's Mrs. McGillicuddy going to say? So I'm, I'm having chest pain. And what's the first thing they're going to associate that with? I'm having a heart attack, right? So. When we start getting into medical screening, one of the big concepts we're going to cover is how do I differentiate whether or not my patient's having a heart attack versus are they having indigestion or heartburn? Or are they having something like pericarditis, right? Do they have inflammation of the pericardium or the pericardial sac? So these are big things that we need to understand. So the first big, like huge component of this is understand that the phrenic nerve is going to innervate the pericardium. As we're going to see, the actual cardiac muscle is going to be innervated by an entirely different network of nerves. That is extremely important to remember because cardiac tissue, remember, and this is going to be one of the very few times we don't talk about skeletal muscle in this class, it's going to be a special cardiac muscle. Special cardiac muscle has its own let's call it challenges, its own opportunities, and therefore it's going to need its own different set of innervation, right? And you guys kind of talked about that in physiology last semester with the entire conduction system of the heart, the SA node and the AV node, and you guys covered that, correct? Sweet, good. We'll touch on that a tiny, tiny bit in this course, but I don't spend a whole lot of time on the conduction system. Now, the other big function of the pericardium is let's think about this, right? Okay, so what's the job of the heart? Get blood all over the body, right? Collect blood, shoot it over to the lungs, collect that blood, shoot it out to the body, right? Basically, it's a, it's a big pumping station. It's really all it is. The pericardium is very important because it prevents overfilling. Okay, so this pericardium is going to prevent overfilling. And we need that. Yes, Adonis. We're not able to see the drawings. What? That just absolutely. What do you mean you can't see the drawings? OK, hold on. Uh, now, yeah. Ruin my day. <laughs> oh. Now you can see them? Yes, sir. Okay, then we're just going to go with that view. Here's what we'll do. Do, 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 do. That'll go away. God, they look even worse now. Okay, no worries. Thank you for telling me. You're welcome. Can you still see them? Yes, sir. Sweet. Okay, good. We'll just go with that. All right, so my pericardium is going to prevent overfilling of the heart. Okay, and obviously that's very, very important because if all my blood's in my heart, where's it not? Anywhere else, right? So I need to have a good balance between the amount of blood that's in my heart and not in my heart. So my pericardium really does a nice job with that. The other thing that the pericardium is going to do is the pericardium is going to how do I want to put this? It provides lubricant. And specifically what we're going to see, and we'll go over this a little bit more, is that my serous layer 
there's going to be the layer of the pericardium that provides that lubrication. And we can see this very, very typically in a lot of medical terminology. Okay, so we're going to hear serum, right? So when we hear serum, what do we think of? Some sort of liquid, some sort of syrupy, whatever. A lot of times it was used in like medieval medicine, right? If you play a lot of video games like I do, there's a serum involved. But the serum a lot of times is used in a little bit of an alteration in a lot of terms. So a lot of times I'll have patients that will come in and they're post-operative and I have to make a statement on the drainage that they have coming out of their wound. Because one huge problem we have with post-operative patients is infection, right? So if I have a clear fluid coming out of a wound, that's going to be a serous fluid. If I have a clear with a little bit of bloody tinge, that's going to be serosanguinous fluid. Sanguine is blood. So if you ever have the drink sangria, that's why they call it sangria, it's because it's blood red. The whole white sangria thing is kind of like white chocolate and doesn't really exist. Right? Why, you guys know that white chocolate is not really chocolate? Okay, good. I apologize if I uh, offended any white chocolate lovers in here. <clears throat> so in terms of what the pericardium is going to do, like I said, it's going to provide this thick wall that's going to prevent overfilling. It's also going to provide some lubrication. Am I okay to erase this? Okay, sweet. <gasps> it's not going to erase. You know what? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Try the lasso thing? Okay. Oh, uh, that's cool. Ah. Back here at the top? Okay. That's what let me undo. Oh no. I may have to rethink. Ah. A new slide. <laughs> jeez. Okay, fair enough. Oh, jeez. This is fun. All right. Pericardium we go. All right, so in terms of the pericardium, what we're going to have is we're going to have something called a fibrous layer. And we're going to have something called a serous layer. And then we're also going to have this tiny little layer called a visceral layer. So like I said, the fibrous layer is going to be Super tough. And this is going to be the most external layer. The serous layer is going to have fluid making capabilities. And this is going to be more internal. And then we're going to have this very, very this external. So this is going to be the most external. And it's going to adhere to the outside of the heart. That should be internal. <clears throat> so a way that I have seen the pericardium taught and what we're going to see as well when we start getting into the abdomen is we're going to start having something called a peritoneum. So pericardium 
means surrounding, beside, next to the heart. Peritoneum is going to be surrounding, outside, next to the abdominal cavity. And a really good way I have seen this explained, and this gets a little confusing, okay? And this is where the viscera gets a little tough, to be quite honest with you, is that we're going to have some organs that are within the pericardial sac or within the peritoneal sacs. And then we're going to have other structures that are outside that peritoneum or the pericardium. And a really good analogy that I saw is if we kind of imagine the pericardium being a balloon, okay, and we fill that balloon up, imagine my fist being my heart, and it's going to push down into that balloon. Now, what does that mean? That means my, that balloon surrounds my entire hand, okay? But my hand is not inside the balloon, okay? So that becomes very important because what we need to realize is that I'm going to have basically like two large sacs here. The first sac is going to be this fibrous layer. This is not changing color on me. Boy, how about first day of class, huh? Jeez. There we go. So this visceral layer is going to come, come up and around. And to kind of orient you, this is going to be the anterior portion. This will be the posterior portion. So this is going to be my fibrous layer. And then the serous layer is going to, and we're going to draw this in, there's going to be a little bit of space in between the fibrous layer and the serous layer, where there's going to be some fluid. And this is a double walled layer. Okay, so it kind of comes back on itself like this. And then in the middle here is where my heart sits. So my heart's going to be kind of like that. And I should say this is going to be kind of a top down look. So what we can see here is that my heart, as you can see, kind of pushes down into this pericardial sac, especially the serous sac here. But the serous sac is, and I'll draw it in here, I'll kind of fill it in so you guys get a little better view of it. My heart is not actually contained inside that serous pericardium or that serous layer. It simply kind of pushes in. Now, as you guys take other coursework and take a little more embryology, what you'll notice is that the heart doesn't start in the chest. As we develop as human beings, my heart actually starts up in my throat and then it descends down into my chest. No, I'm sorry, my heart starts in my gut and descends upward, uh, up, upward into my chest. So what happens a lot of times is that as these organs start moving into what is now their proper position for us as toddlers and adolescents and adults, they start pushing these sacs so that they can get into position. And then the sac kind of is there, but it gets thinned out because it has this big organ pushing up against it. So it's kind of important, not only in this section, but especially when we get down into the organs as well, of understanding what is inside the sac, what's in not inside the sac, because we're going to get into all sorts of great things um, like omentums, which basically is the Greek word for apron. So as you guys open up the viscera, 
don't expect just to see, hey, there's the liver and everything. You're going to see this huge, it's going to look like an apron, this huge apron of connective tissue. And what that is, that's going to be part of the peritoneum. And you guys will have to remove that in order to get down to the organs. Yes. Yeah, circle around the heart is going to be the visceral layer. Yep. Thank you for pointing that out. Let me draw that in. Okay. Any questions on that? Everybody good with this? Okay. Everybody have a good break. Study anatomy the entire break, to be honest, right? <laughs> it's okay. Neither did I, if that makes you feel better. All right. <clears throat> All right, so this is going to be one of the very few sections that has some muscle, okay? I'm not necessarily going to cover the muscle using these pictures. I'm going to kind of try to take a, in fact, what I'm going to do is this. Let's have a better picture here. Give me one second. I know I put better pictures in here. We're going to kind of cover these muscles via the intercostal spaces. Okay. So the last two muscles on this slide, we're not going to cover levator costorum because it really doesn't do much of anything. But this guy is going to be on the next slide, and this guy is going to be on the next slide. Okay. So the three we're going to cover on this slide are going to be external intercostal internal intercostal, innermost intercostal, okay? Nice and easy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take basically kind of a microscopic view. So the way this works is if I have a rib, okay, and the ribs kind of have this almost teardrop shape to them, okay? And we're gonna draw two of those in. And then what we're going to see is that I'm going to have a series of three muscles. Okay, so this is going to be the external portion, kind of orient you. This will be the internal portion. This will be superior. And this down here will be obviously inferior. Okay, so the first one we're going to cover is basically going to be the external intercostal. Now the external intercostal is gonna have a fiber orientation kind of like that. Okay, so that's gonna be my external intercostal. So the external intercostal is gonna be really, really big, important muscle. And the thing that gets people screwed up, I get this one backwards quite often, is because of the way the word is made, it's most commonly thought external, it's gonna help with expiration. It's not, it's gonna be the opposite, okay? So my external intercostal is actually gonna be most active during inspiration so when i inspire when i breathe air in expand my lungs my external intercostals are going to be most active now to be perfectly honest these muscles are not doing a ton for me in terms of respiration my diaphragm is going to be doing the majority of the work here but I need a little extra oomph 
to get those ribs out of the way. And the external intercostal is going to give me that little extra oomph during inspiration. The next one we're going to encounter is going to be the internal intercostal. And the internal intercostal is going to have a fiber orientation essentially at like a 90 degree tangent or basically in the opposite direction. And it basically attaches the inferior surface of the rib above to the superior surface, the rib below. Same thing with the external intercostal. Basically, they just attach rib to rib. Like we said, the external intercostal is most active during inspiration. So my internal intercostal is going to be most active during expiration. And in reality, if we think about it, if my ribs are moving upward against gravity during inspiration, I should be able to utilize gravity along with the relaxation of my diaphragm to expire air, to get air out of me. So really where we see the internal intercostals most active is going to be during forceful expiration. We'll also see this a little later on with my abdominal muscles too, right? Let's think about it. Who's had a really bad coughing fit? Were your abs sore the next day? Sometimes, yeah. For those who've had a really bad coughing fit, sometimes the side of your ribs can be sore too. Because I'm trying to use everything I can. I'm trying to pump every muscle I can to get that air out. So typically where we're going to see the internal intercostals most active is not during normal expiration, but it's going to be during forceful expiration. OK, so take that information, run it into the clinic. Hey, I'm having some side flank pain, some rib pain. You know, I took a fastball in the gut and whatever it is. OK, what symptoms are you having? Well, every time I cough, it seems like I really hurt. So what we can start thinking about as therapists is what muscles are active during that coughing experience, that forceful expiration? Where do they attach? What innervates them? Right, all those kind of basic MSK questions that we kind of encountered last semester. With all those questions, we can take all that information and we can start providing clinical reasoning, right? We can start providing some clinical judgment to what we think may be the diagnosis of the pathology, right? That's why we learn this stuff. So think about that, right? Because the patient's not going to come into you and say, you know, I'm having trouble during forced or expiration. When patients come in and do that, like I'll give you an example. So I had this guy, he came in and says, yeah, I had an intraarticular injection done in my shoulder. I was like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a uh, oral surgeon. Got it. Right. People are not typically using these terms. Now, what we're going to see in terms of innervation is this is going to go back to and think back to tests and measures last semester. You guys talked about myotomes and dermatomes, right? Upper extremities, lower extremities. Do you remember how the orientation was? for the rib cage and the thorax. Remember all those horizontal lines? Okay, that's where this is going to start coming in. Because what we're going to see is that the innervation is going to be at the level of the ribs. Okay, so in grays, you're going to see, oh yeah, it's innervated by the intercostal nerves, blah, 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 and gives you a whole bunch of numbers. What it's really saying is, that that intercostal muscle that's in between the eighth and ninth rib is going to be supplied by that one little nerve that goes right in between. Because this is what we see, and this is one of the great things about the human body. There are many, this is one of them. 
what we're going to see is that right back here, we're going to have. Oh, it went away. We're going to have a vein. We're going to have an artery. and we're, It did it again. Oh, I'm going to complain to Bill Gates. Okay, so we're going to have an intercostal artery. Oh, it stayed. Yay. No, it didn't. The dot went away. We're going to have an. Intercostal vein. And we're going to have an, sorry for the yellow. Intercostal nerve. Now what's really. A great benefit is that the intercostal artery, the intercostal vein, the intercostal nerve are going to sit just inside that inferior hook of each rib. So that's extremely important because, and it's actually a great protective mechanism. With those structures sitting right inside that little groove, in, in the costal margin, they can stay a little bit protected. It's also really nice because there are times, and you guys won't necessarily see this as PTs, not in this day and age, maybe in the future, where you got to put a chest tube in somebody. Okay. Or you may have a patient that has a chest tube. I will say that a lot of acute care. When I work at QCAN, I do work in a considerable amount. I see a lot of patients with tubes come out of just about everywhere. And you guys, who's excited for acute care this semester? Yeah, it gets it gets pretty interesting. I personally, I like doing acute care. You get to see some fun stuff. Um, but when they put in these chest tubes, they really don't have to worry too much about hitting the intercostal nerve, artery, or vein, because as long as they put that tube in, In between, as long as you put that tube straight in, so this being the tube, it's not going to hit any of those structures. Okay, so that's just one of the nice little things about the human body that actually is a really good protective mechanism. All right, any questions about external or internal intercostals? I'm good. Okay, the next one we're going to cover here is going to be the innermost intercostal. Now, what we're going to see with these innermost intercostals is the fact that it's going to basically follow, and I'm not going to cover the inner too much. It's basically going to follow the same fiber orientation as the externals. So this guy is the innermost intercostal. So if it has the same fiber orientation as the external intercostal, we probably can speculate it's probably going to have the same actions. OK, so my innermost intercostal is still going to be active during. Inspiration. So really what we need to think about here again, I get this gets a lot of folks tripped up. It trips me up all the time. External intercostal inspiration. Internal intercostal expiration. Innermost intercostal inspiration. Great. Yes. It it can be. It can be. A lot of times and it really depends on how they do the EMG studies. So the question for, for those at home is, is innermost intercostal more of an eccentric contraction? It definitely can be. So there can be a lot of stretch reflex, depending on if you inspire too much. 
Now you're going to have some cartilage there. You're going to have a little bit of tendon there as well because there's something has to attach this to the bone. So a lot of times you're just going to get a lot of stretch reflex out of it. But good question. Good question. All right. How are we doing, guys? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So the next couple we're going to cover is going to be the subcostals and these transverse thoraces. Okay. Now the subcostals are basically going to be the, and I'll be quite honest with you, they're difficult to find, right? Because this is going to be our picture for the subcostals up here. This guy right here. So taking a look at that picture, these muscles are going to be on the posterior portion of the thorax. One muscle that typically just kind of blends in with these guys is going to be iliocostalis. If you guys remember that from last semester. Okay, why? Why? Because it's kind of in the same spot. So to be quite honest with you, I don't cover subcostals too, too much because they really don't do a whole lot. They're just kind of there, right? They're kind of like that little pesky, like serratus posterior superior muscle. Remember that little thing? It's like it has a density of toilet paper. I mean, come on. If you can see through the muscle, it's not going to do a whole lot for you, right? Exactly. The other muscle we're going to see is going to be this transverse thoracis, and that's going to be this guy down here. Transverse thoracis, as weird as it sounds, what we're looking at here is the inside of the rib cage. So this is a very easily identified one. So for those that are going to be in cadaver lab today, we are going to crack the chest open today. OK. It's. I will say I was explaining this to a couple groups out in the hallway. It's easier to crack lobster than it is. And it's, I'm sorry, it's harder to crack lobster than it is the chest. So we're going to use some rib shears. It's really not going to be that difficult. But as we pull that rib cage off, so what I want you to kind of think about is if I took my rib cage and pulled it off and I'm looking at the deep side, I'm going to see this transversus thoracis or transverse thoracis. That's another one of those muscles says where it is, is where it says, says what it is, is what it says, right? It is the thoracic muscle that's in the transverse plane. That's all it means. Its job is going to be a little more help with expiration. OK, and we can kind of see that from the fiber orientation. So this is going to be another one of those. Expiration muscles. It is it's good to note because you guys are definitely going to see that in lab. And I like to note it because when you crack that rib open or crack those ribs open and pull that chest wall off, it is very, very prominent in most, if not all the cadavers. So I want to make sure you guys know what you're looking at. Yes. That's correct. Yep, it's correcting the ribs to the sternum. All right. So like I said, those are a couple other muscles you guys subcostals. Yes. Yes, they're all in the anterior side. Yep. <clears throat> so transverse thoracis attaches ribs or the costal cartilage down into the sternum, provides a little bit of extra oomph during expiration. And what I want you to start thinking about as this starts relating into function of the diaphragm is think about we have this huge huge diaphragm right we have kind of this parachute of a muscle that helps us take in all this air we have all these tiny don't really do a whole lot on their own muscles that do expiration right which is kind of does its thing now what helps us with expiration 
is this will get a little bit into the diaphragm is how the diaphragm contracts. OK, so so basically what I want everybody to do, and this will kind of get into the diaphragm a little bit, is kind of take your hands, put them into a dome. OK, now what's going to sit right on top of my diaphragm? My lungs, right? When my diaphragm contracts, what's going to happen is it's going to flatten. Right? OK, as it flattens. That's going to allow space, which is going to allow my lungs to fill up. My diaphragm, when it relaxes, is going to go back into what position? It's going to go back into this dome position. So my diaphragm relaxing is going to force air out of my lungs. OK, so that's a very important concept to remember because that's not necessarily an active process, right? I can't actively contract my diaphragm and force air out of my lungs. So that that is another thing as a physical therapist we need to look at, right? So when in the inspiration expiration cycles, my patient having pain. So remember diaphragm contracted during inspiration, diaphragm relaxed during expiration. All right, so let's get into the heart. First thing I want to do, is I'm going to go one slide forward, and then we're going to go back a slide here. So big thing, and these are two pictures straight out of the dissector that you guys use in lab, okay? So you guys can pull the dissector up in lab. You're going to find these pictures. One huge, huge issue that students tend to have, and I have this issue myself, is orienting where you are on the heart. Let's face it, OK, we're going to have a lab exam come up here in a couple months, and there's going to be some hearts on that lab exam. You're going to take a look at that heart, and the first thing you're going to say is, which way is up? Which way is the front? Which way is the back? Right? because everything's going to be named based on its location. What I want you to think about is there's going to be some very easy key landmarks that I want you to think about and look at that's going to help you out quickly orient where you are in the heart. The first big one, OK, and what I will say is well, obviously we're looking at an anterior view on the left, posterior view on the right. The first big one that's really going to help you out here is going to be this big guy here. OK, and that's going to be my aorta. So what I would personally recommend is when you have that heart in your hands in lab, find the aorta first. OK, because if I can see a nice big aorta coming off of what's going to end up being the left ventricle. I know I'm looking at the anterior portion of the heart. In terms of looking at the posterior portion of the heart, these four guys right here, I would recommend using as a landmark. And this is going to be pulmonary trunk. Now, as we remember from last semester, when I hear the word trunk, it means that I'm going to have several pieces coming off of it, right? Remember, common means two pieces coming off. Trunk is going to mean a whole lot more than two. So my pulmonary trunk is going to give way to what? Pulmonary arteries or pulmonary veins or something like that, right? Pulmonary something. But my pulmonary trunk is going to have four vessels coming off of it. OK, so as far as orientation goes, that's what I would recommend using, because as we start getting into the heart and its vessels, trust me when I say this. In a timed lab exam sort of scenario, you want to be able to quickly orient. Where you're at, because. 
what we're going to have and what we're going to see and what you guys are going to start dissecting are little things like this. And there's one on the front side and there's one on the back side too. Anybody want to take a guess what that little guy is? I heard I heard mumbles. The Widowmaker, right? Why is it called the Widowmaker? Because it makes widows, right? It says what it is, says, is what it says. So the reason that is called the Widowmaker, and that that is the unfortunately the slang term, is that is the left anterior descending artery. Now, this is where things get just a touch confusing because that looks to me like it's on the front of the heart, right? But what we're going to see is that this portion over here is going to be the left side of my heart. So my left anterior descending artery is going to provide blood to the left side of my heart. And yeah, you're right. If we have a left anterior descending, we're probably going to have a left posterior descending too. But as you guys can see, if I don't know where I am on the heart, this can get real confusing real fast. Okay, so I want to make sure we take some extra time just on basic orientation. Where am I at? OK, any questions on that? So the Widowmaker is the left anterior descending artery. And the reason is, to Chris's point, it provides such a large portion of the heart with blood that when it clogs or dissects or goes kablooey, as that's a technical term, kablooey, um, you will not have heart function anymore. So there's a lot of times that folks will go in. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, exactly. And there's a lot of times that folks will go in and they will have EKG done or they'll have an echo done or they'll have, you know, in some sort of blood test or just a heart function and they'll determine you know what? That left anterior descending is 50% occluded, 80% occluded, whatever it is. They'll just go in and catheterize it because it's not going to get any better, right? If it's already 80% clogged, it's not going to get any better. I don't care how much broccoli you eat for the next three weeks, it's not going to go back to zero, right? And it's just the way it is. So they'll a lot of times go in. And they'll do a catheterization. You guys know what a catheterization is? Kind of, sort of? OK. Um, if you don't, you guys will definitely cover it in cardiopulm. And you'll cover several heart conditions and heart surgery in cardiopulm. All right, very good. So heart, heart's about the size of a fist. To me, it kind of looks like a mango. And what we're going to do is I'm going to draw a very rudimentary picture of the heart, and then we'll draw a less rudimentary picture of the heart. So here's my heart. I wasn't lying. And my heart's going to have four basic chambers to it. I'm going to have a right anterior, a right atrium. I'm going to have a right ventricle. And if I have right atriums and right ventricles, chances are I have a left atrium and left ventricle too, right? I have a left atrium and a left ventricle. Now the word atrium simply means opening, right? So if you've ever been to a really nice hotel, really nice restaurant, and they have these nice big expansive areas, that is an atrium, right? It's a nice open space, 
There's a lot of sniffs that have atriums. All right, so the word atrium is simply going to mean open space. Well, my atriums or my atria basically do as they're going to receive a bunch of blood. Okay, so that's basically the job of the atrium is they're just going to take in a bunch of blood. This becomes very important because as we start looking at the myocardium, okay, so myo obviously meaning muscle, cardium meaning heart, we're going to see a lot of differences in thickness. Okay, so a couple, one of the big things we're going to do in lab is we're actually going to cut a couple of these hearts in a couple different sections. So that way you guys can see some of the differences in the thickness of the myocardium. So if I have a portion of the heart that's simply just kind of a holding tank, it's kind of there, it contracts a little bit, I'm probably going to expect to see that layer or that wall be very thin. Okay, that's typically what we see with the myocardium, with the right atrium, excuse me, is that I have a very thin wall of muscle. Okay. The job of the right atrium is it is going to receive deoxygenated blood, which we're going to say no O2 or low O2. And its job is to send it to the ventricle. So it's going to receive blood from three main sources. Okay. The number one source is going to be what we call the SVC, which is going to be superior vena cava. And that's going to drain in all the blood basically above the heart. I'm also going to have an IVC, which is going to be inferior vena cava. And that's going to take in all the blood kind of below the level of the heart or the diaphragm because they're basically almost in the same line. And then the third source is going to be from the heart itself, right? And this is the great thing about the heart. And this is where we see a lot of problems, especially with our cardiac patients and even a lot of folks just walking around life is because the heart contracts so forcefully and even though the heart is full of blood it actually needs its own blood supply in order to operate okay so what we're going to see is that my cardiac arteries my coronary arteries my coronary veins or cardiac veins are going to be the blood supply to the heart itself now that becomes its own separate issue because not only do I have blood inside the heart, but now I have blood kind of coursing outside the heart as well. And then if you think about it, I need to get that blood just like I need to get blood in from the body to be reoxygenated. I also need to get blood in from the heart to be reoxygenated re as well. Okay. So the three big areas the right atrium is going to receive blood from are going to be superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and the heart itself. Okay. Now, what's going to happen here is the right atrium, after it collects all this blood, it is going to shoot it down via a valve down to the right ventricle. And this valve is going to be the tricuspid valve. So obviously, tri meaning three, and cusp meaning leaf. That's what a cusp means, right? 
or three edges, right? So if I'm on the cusp of greatness, trust me, I'm not on the cusp of greatness. OK, I'm on the cusp of mediocrity, but I'm, but I'm on the cusp of something. So if I'm on the cusp of something, I'm right at that edge, right? I'm just about going to go in there, right? So I have a tricuspid valve. That tricuspid valve is going to get opened. And blood's going to dump in from the right atrium down to the right ventricle. Then my right ventricle is going to have a little more muscle, OK? So it's going to have a thicker wall. So we're going to draw a little thicker wall in here. OK, to represent. More muscle. My right ventricle has the job. Of getting my deoxygenated blood. OK, so what I'm going to do with my right ventricle is I need to get deoxygenated blood. Where do you think it needs to go if it doesn't have any oxygen in it? My lungs, right? So I have deoxygenated blood. It's going to shoot out and it's going to get to the lungs. Now the vehicle it's going to go in. And we'll cover this again. Is it's going to go through my pulmonary arteries. Now artery meaning moving away from the heart, right? We've covered that one. Really super duper gets people tripped up. Thing to remember, hashtag smiley face, whatever you got to do. Pulmonary arteries are going to be the only arteries that have deoxygenated blood in them. OK. And this is going to become very important because if I have pulmonary arteries, chances are I'm going to have pulmonary veins too, right? My pulmonary veins are going to have oxygenated blood. It's the only time in the human body where we see oxygenated blood in the vein and not in an artery. OK, so pulmonary arteries, deoxygenated blood moving from my right ventricle to my lungs. My pulmonary veins are then going to bring that oxygenated blood into my left atrium. OK, so my atrium is another receiving tank. So it's going to receive. Oxygenated blood. From the lungs. Via. <clears throat> the pulmonary veins. No big deal. Nice and easy, right? Because my left atrium is going to act just like my right atrium does. All it's going to do is it's going to dump in. Blood into the left ventricle. Via. The bicuspid valve. Now I'm going to take a side note. And kind of talk about the naming of these valves because depending on what textbook you read. You will see these valves called. A hundred gazillion different names. The tricuspid valve. Can also go by the name of the right AV valve, right atrioventricular valve. That's probably going to be. I'm not even going to say more accurate or less accurate. It is kind of is. OK, so. I like the thick one. So tricuspid. Equals right a V valve as well. Bicuspid. Can equal left. AV, but the original anatomist thought they'd be cute and also call it the mitral valve. Now, the reason it's called the mitral valve is somebody with a lot more imagination than me, because I don't see it, 
thought that if you turn the valve in just the right angle with the light coming through the window at just the right way, and you only look through your left eye and turn your head to about 45 degrees lateral flexion, it looks like the hat that a bishop wears. I don't see it. Right, and that's my point. But at the same time, it's called a mitral valve. So I want you guys to understand that the mitral valve is synonymous with bicuspid valve, which is synonymous with the left atrioventricular valve. OK. The reason the bicuspid valve is called the bicuspid valve is simply because it has two leaves, not three. Now, there's a couple different ways to remember this. Me personally. I like the fact that right has more letters than left. So the tricuspid valve has more valve, more sides, more leaves. For the right, so tricuspid right. I've also heard another analogy that the tricuspid valve tries to be right. That's another good one as well. And then the bicuspid valve is just kind of off in its own little weird world, so it can be bicuspid. That's just a, way, a couple of ways that may be a little easier to remember. As we get into some of the weirdo terminology, because we're going to get into some big high dollar words, I'm going to try to give you guys more mnemonic devices as the semester goes to try to help you out with remembering some of these terms. OK, simply because I recognize, especially when we start getting into the, the viscera and the pelvis, there's going to be a lot of words that are going to win you a lot of points at Scrabble. <clears throat> OK, any questions on that? OK. So the last thing I want to kind of cover here. And this is simply going to be another kind of orientation thing, and this is going to be the last thing we cover for the day and I'll let you guys go. Is where we're going to see each of these. Ventricles atriums sides of the heart actually in the human body okay so what we have to understand is that when we crack that chest open we're going to see the pericardium we're going to pull that pericardium off and we're going to see the heart we're going to go oh sweet now what am i looking at what we have to understand is that the heart is going to not sit in a vertical orientation is going to kind of sit at this weird oblique orientation. And basically what's going to happen here. Is the heart's going to kind of sit with an apex. Shelly, I understand this is a horrible picture. <laughs> And it, did, see, it didn't even take. That's how bad it was. The computer wouldn't even take it. Bill Gates came in my computer and wouldn't even let me take, put that picture in. That's how bad it was. That's not any better. OK, so I'm going to have something called my apex. I'm sorry. It does kind of look like a ham. Well, depending on you know, what everyone's eating, some, some are made out of ham. So what I'm going to have here is this apex is actually going to be part of. My left ventricle. So what I'm going to see. Is. This left ventricle is going to be on this anterior portion It's going to make up the majority of the anterior portion of the heart. So when I'm looking at it from a anterior perspective. That's going to be my left ventricle. Over here on the side, what I'm going to see. So I'm going to have a smaller section here. I just got myself. See, see how easy it is to get confused. Now that's going to be what? My right atria?
Other thing to remember here is that my aorta is going to kind of come out up and around this direction. And we should know that a little bit from physiology is that another thing, like I said, find the aorta because that's going to be one of the big landmarks here. Because my left ventricle is then going to pump blood through my aorta to get it to the rest of the body. What we're going to see here as well is that I'm going to have a diaphragm that's going to sit right underneath as well. We're going to draw that in. Let's go orange. And so kind of my left ventricle is going to kind of sit on the diaphragm. So that's from the anterior view. OK, so that'd be this view over here. Any questions? All right, let's go ahead. We'll cover posterior view and we'll cover other stuff on Wednesday. Everybody have a good rest of your day. That was a good, good warm up to the rest of the semester, right? Yay.